Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Last week we asked the question, what is the church? And I acknowledge the fact that our culture, there's obviously a huge divide happening right within the midst of us as believers. So this week I want to actually ask the question and examine the question of where do we fit in? Where do I fit in? So if last week was the what, this week is going to be the why. But before we go any further, let's just take a moment, let me pray. So Father God, bless everything thought this morning, everything spoken, and everything felt in the hearts. And may we leave this place knowing that we have heard your voice. And may we be healing agents to those that you have placed in our world. Amen. So when I say the word church, what comes to mind? Do you have positive or negative feelings? Do you see a building or do you see a group of people? And the reality is we all have different experiences that are wrapped up in this word called church. And for some, the experience is incredibly positive. For others, you're honestly probably in what we would call church recovery. It's a program. And next week, speaking of which, we're going to deal with church hurt, or chert, as we affectionately call it on staff. So if you know somebody who's been hurt by the church, and even maybe this one, my challenge to you is to invite them. Have them come and experience next Sunday. The fact is that every Sunday we bring our experiences with us. And uh, again, our experience are made up here by a diverse group of people with many different preferences, many different functions, right? Paul describes a church in 1 Corinthians 12. He says the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up only one body. So it is with the body of Christ. Again, remember, the church is the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free, but we've all been baptized into Christ's body by one spirit, and we've all have received the same Spirit. So when you say yes to Jesus, God's Holy Spirit comes to live within you, whether you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we're all given one Spirit to drink, and God's Holy Spirit unites us all. And we realize that God works in each of our lives individually, locally, and He works on a universal or global scale. So when it comes to the local church, there's a common question I think that we all inherently ask. Do I belong here? And I think belonging is something that we all want, something that we all desire, but it's more than just a desire. Belonging is something that is very deep. It's actually a profound need that humans have. I'm sure many of you are familiar with scholar Brene Brown. She describes belonging as an irreducible need And she goes on to say that humans are biologically and cognitively and physically and spiritually wired to love and to be loved and to belong. But belonging is not as easy as it sounds. It's actually incredibly hard work. And belonging is not the same as simply just showing up or signing up to something Brown goes on and she states that belonging is the innate human desire to be a part of something larger than us. I love that. And she adds, she goes on and says, because this yearning is is so primal, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and by seeking approval, which are basically not the same thing. The fact is we desperately want to belong to something bigger than ourselves, and we want this so badly that sometimes we will do whatever it takes to achieve this, and sometimes that could even be very negative. And so we live in a time where true belonging is becoming rare and more rare and yet more desperately needed. Professor of philosophy, James uh, K.A. Smith, he he made this comment. He says, people come to church and have no clue why. (laughs) They sing a few songs. I hope you're following with me. They listen to a sermon. They go back to their lives without any change. The problem is that they have no understanding as to why they are doing what they are doing. (laughs) 
I just want to let that sit. If the common church attender comes to worship on Sunday but does not know why, we have a problem. Why then should you go to church? Gather together. Be the called out ones. Remember from last week. Actually, to be more theologically accurate, why should we gather with the church? Since the church is not the building, but the church is the group of believers. So why do we gather as a church? We church to glorify God. We do that. We gather around God. Romans 12, 1, commands us to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. This, this lifestyle propels us then it, 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 to communal witnessing, living our life, shining a bright light. It, it compels us when we gather as the church, it compels us to repent. We reflect, we ask for forgiveness. Well, like I said earlier, we worship, we, we get taught or we teach uh, we gather because we are one body drawn together by God to be a people of God who live for God. This is why it's so important. We testify to God's greatness. We, we disciple others through our life together. We serve, we teach, we encourage not just one another, but the world at large when we leave this place and go make an influence where God has placed us. And all, you know, we do not ultimately come together for Sunday worship to experience an emotional response that brings joy to us as consumers. And I will say that many Westerners gather for this very reason. That church and coming together is all about me and my preferences. Rather, we gather because God has united us. We gather because we live life together in being effective witnesses to our local communities. We have a message to share, a message of freedom, one of deliverance, one of encouragement. And so we gather because the diversity of the local church should mirror heaven. Did you hear that? The church should mirror heaven to a dying, lost, and sinful world. Christians were made to gather together. And thankfully, everybody in church, the church, has a purpose. Ephesians 4.16 offers wisdom. Everyone is knit together, supporting one another in order to grow the body and building up love. Because what we do is we fulfill the rules that God has given us. If every individual person has a purpose, then when it comes to fruition, by, to obedience, then the body grows. If we're all doing our part, the body grows. When people come together as the church, community outreach begins. Discipleship succeeds. Life is lived out together. It compels the advancement of the message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And the people of God grow as individuals because of active engagement in the community of the believers. Christ being the head of the church gives Christians a solid foundation and a leader to follow and imitate daily. That's who we imitate. In John 17, Jesus prayed for the future believers to be united. He's praying for us to be united as he's united with the Father. And so we gather so that we can be like Jesus. We gather because we get to enjoy this relationship with God and we get to enjoy the relationship with one another. Make friends. Be a part of the community because we have something in common. And everyone has a purpose in the local church, both corporately and individually. In fact, the strengths and weaknesses of the members of the local church are not only intentional, I will say to you that the strengths and weaknesses of us in the local church are complementary. That's where we need each other. Everyone has something that the other does not have. So what happens when we come together, and I see this on our leadership team, that when we come together, we're actually stronger than we are apart. And that's the beautiful truth of a church. And we need to look at every person in our community as being a vital member of the family. And if I'm lacking where you, maybe you're strong, your strengths challenge me to grow, maybe address my weaknesses and vice versa. Our vocations and personalities help showcase the beauty of the diversity of the church. So thank God that everyone is different. 
Look at the person next to you. Thank the Lord that you're not like them. Right? Everyone is different. May we not forget the need for those differences. The book of 1 Timothy is exceptionally helpful in that it helps us to see what the church is all about. In other words, 1 Timothy actually shows us the important aspects of the foundation regarding what it means for the church to be the church. This book was written to help a young man, a young pastor, to know what to do. It's phenomenal to know what to do in a church because this guy needed help. And Paul wants to visit Timothy, and he can't. And he's concerned that's going to take him a little bit longer. And so what does he do? He writes him, and he writes this letter to Timothy to help him to know what to do. And so he writes, he goes, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. <clears throat> Paul wants Timothy to know how one ought to behave in church. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul tells Timothy to be an example of his speech and conduct. He writes, command and teach these things. Don't let anybody look down on you because you are young. And all the guys in the front row are going, yeah, that's my favorite verse. Right? But set an example for the believers in how? In speech, in conduct. Like these are loaded words for our culture today. In speech, in conduct, in love, believers, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, to teaching. You see this call to come together. Don't neglect your gift. In other words, you have something to contribute, which was given to you through the prophecy when the body of the elders laid their hands on you. Now he's speaking specifically to Timothy. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everybody may see your progress. And then he goes, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Preserve in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So tucked into this pastoral admonition, if I can put it that way, is this great description of the importance of the church. The phrase that follows, conduct themselves, gives us reasonal, this rationale or the basis for taking this church behavior issue so seriously. This description shows us the importance of the church, and I believe without question that there are three non-negotiables for the church that we need to dial into today because they give us a clear sense as to why the church is important, and they also give us some key characteristics that are non-negotiable for the church. In other words, while some parts of the church will continue to change as culture changes. How many remember if you've grown up in the church, you, you know, what was church like in the 90s? Or if our worship team sings a song, it's, oh, that's so 2000, right? Like, you know, we're going like, like really, honestly, it wasn't that long ago. Like, you're, Wait, it's 221. Maybe, okay, 20 years ago. Do we remember what church was like in the 80s? Ladies? <laughs> right? Right? Hey, kids. Oh, yeah, you know, pandemic's over, right? I can't wear pajamas when I come on Sunday morning to Seoul. I know your parents are wanting you to wear jeans, right? right? We had to wear suits. Gentlemen, remember the three-piece suits? And some of you guys are laughing. Some are shaking, and some are going to, you know... Well, Sharon will be there for counseling afterwards if we have to go back there. But that's what it was. So culture changes. Culture changes. And so parts of the church is going to continue changes or culture changes. But there's some things that need to be preserved. And in my opinion, these three non-negotiables are relationship, presence, and truth. Relationships, uh, the, the phrase that Paul uses to describe the church is the household of God. You know, this was a passage that was used against me for not having kids run in church. Don't let the kids run around respect the household of God. It has nothing to do with the building. The meaning here is not about reverence as much as it is actually about relationship. The Greek word, the oikos, it can refer to either a physical building or it can refer to a family that lives in a building. 
You know, we do the same thing with our English word household, you know, and, and where we live. You drive by our house, you may say, hey, look, there's the Machalskis, right? That's what we say. And you would mean both our house and our family. So when you think about this, when you, when you invite somebody over to your house, you're not just inviting them over to spend time by themselves in your house, right? Why don't you come to my house and I'm going to walk away? Like, or I'm going to go upstairs, turn on the TV and close the door. Maybe some of you are like that. I don't know. But you're inviting them over to spend time with you. In other words, household usually refers to a location where relationships take place. And such a household brings together the location and the people who are characterized by the location. So it works together. So when Paul describes the church as being the household of God, he's speaking about being a part of the family of God. He is making a powerful and beautiful statement about the relational connection of God's people. And the relational connection is a product of a common relationship with Jesus Christ as one Savior and Lord. And the beautiful thing about the church is that we come from different backgrounds. We all come from different situations. We come from different cultures. I was talking to a brother and sister today from another culture. I was able to be a part of the celebration and party that was taking place. And I knew more about the culture. I think they were laughing and surprising because I just affirmed it and I loved it. Being exposed to different cultures, it's a reflection of heaven, right? Different cultures, different backgrounds, different situations, and yet we all share one life-defining commonality. Jesus is our Lord and Master. And we all have a common confession. If you think about it, Jesus, you know, Paul says this to Timothy, you know, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I'm the foremost, or I'm the chief, right? Can I get an amen? Aren't we all like that, if we're to be honest? And those who receive Jesus as their Savior, they're also filled with the same Spirit. We've already covered that. And we're brought into God's family. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the miracle of salvation is that God not only forgives us through the death and resurrection of His Son, but He welcomes us into His family. He adopts us, according to Romans 8. And the result is this group of people of misfits who are marked with a commonality in Jesus and the common denominator. The local focal point is our common relationship with Jesus. And so what does this do to the church? Really, when you think about it, it makes the collective gathering of God's people like nothing else on earth. We come together. And in fact, it should be so transformative that it should look a little bit like heaven when we are here. It means that we're all part of God's family. We're brothers and sisters in the same family of God. And there's a result that we should actually treat each other differently. There's an expectation that we gather for this purpose of what? Coming and celebrating Jesus that, that actually should change in the way that we interact with each other. It should be able to cause us to break down the barriers, causing us to care for one another in a beautiful and yet different way than what's going on in our society around us. And our love for Jesus eclipses all differences. It should. You know, we, we, we sort of do this in other arenas as well. You go to a bomber or a Jets game. It never ceases to amaze me the unifying power of a touchdown or a goal. You know, people who don't even know each other, we cheer together and high-five each other in a common purpose. And that common purpose, that celebration makes us unified, right? We're all on the same team. And it makes sense, doesn't it? Like, we're, we're all in it together. The beauty of the moment eclipses the differences. We don't really care who it is. We're celebrating because our team scored. However, you wouldn't think of acting like that in Safeway when you found a sale on, on uh, Starbucks coffee, right? You find a great deal on Starbucks coffee, you're not going to be running up to everybody, go, oh, look what I got. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. Or a McDonald's employee hands you your food. Right? It doesn't warrant a celebration, a common celebration. Now again, I'm not suggesting that you do high fives at say for a McDonald's, but I would like you to consider the beauty of what we're celebrating when we gather together, specifically on a Sunday. 
And we sang about it. Jesus has redeemed us. Jesus has saved us. God has adopted us. We are God's children, brothers and sisters of the family of God. We celebrate this together. The second thing is the presence. And Paul adds this description in 1 Timothy 3.15, which is the church of the living God. And let me explain the, the two pieces of this phrase, and then I'll draw it together. So in the ancient world, we know that everything it was filled with all types of idols. Acts chapter 17, Paul's in Athens, and he's provoked in the spirit because the city is full of idols. He sees it. He's bothered. He's troubled. He addresses the Areopagus. Paul ref- makes reference to an idol dedicated to the unknown God, as he affectionately tells it, a clear indication of cultural fascination with idol r- worship. And so obviously, idols are a part of their culture. Ephesus was especially known for idol worship and idol manufacturing, a, a major industry in the city at the time. And Paul's missionary journey, he comes there he, and he challenges the enterprise. And because he challenges the enterprise in Ephesus, he has to flee for his life in Acts chapter 19. Because the people in the city, they carried these small little idols on them, or they had them in their homes or out in their courtyard. And so idol worship was so much, that, that, that's how important it was. And so when Paul talks about living, and you read that in the scripture, the living God, he is actually taking a swipe at the lifeless idols, at the people in Ephesus, In the city of Lystra, Paul's message sounded like this. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. And additionally, the miracles that we read about that Paul performed were designed, why? To demonstrate power of the living God and the impotence of the idols. So don't just hear living as if it was like a neutral description, because it's not. You need to hear it like this. Your idols are dead. Our God is alive. You worship something fake. Our God is real. And Paul's courageously making a statement about the power, about the authority, about the reality of Christianity. In other words, what Paul is saying today is this, this, is to be the real deal. The second thing to note here is the word that we looked at last week, Ecclesia, that, again, that means called out, the idea of the assembly, the called out ones. Think of how we would assemble people in the past, you know, before e-invites or social networking. They, they actually would use word of mouth and ask people. Or in some cases, when the church was together, what they would do, they would blow a horn or they would actually ring a bell or bells, church bells, right? The church is simply an assembly. An assembly of a called out group of people. But it's not normally, it's not a normal assembly. It's an assembly. We come together to meet the living God. The church is the gathering of God's people in the presence of God and this idea of God meeting with his people is part of the great theme of scripture. This idea of being called out to meet with God is central to what the biblical story is all about and what the church is all about. Now take the concept and put it together with the other piece regarding the living God, and this essentially means that the church is a called out group of people who gather to experience the presence of God, the purpose of Sunday worship, the purpose of weekly gathering of God's people is for us to meet the living God. So we sing, we pray, we cry, we shout, we laugh, we pause. This is a theologian, John Stott. He puts it this way. He says, in our worship, we bow down before the living God. Through the reading and exposition of his word, we hear his voice addressing us. We meet him at his table when he makes himself known to us through the breaking of bread. And in our fellowship, we love each other as he loved us. And our witnesses become bolder and more urgent. And indeed, unbelievers coming in may confess that God is really among you. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings Praise Him, all creatures here below. 
Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. What are you feeling? 1980. <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, a common doxology that brings us together, that sings praise, that should make an impact. Now some of you guys are going, I have no word, clue what word you just sang. I can... But you should feel something. Presence. The church is alive. It's vibrant when we gather together. The assembly knows that God is in their midst. And every Sunday we should set our sights on one goal. When we walk into this place, we're meeting with God and with God's people. And this is the called out assembly of the living God because God is here. God is here because we have post-it signs on our cross because people are actually calling out to him and believing in prayer. And then the staff and the prayer team get a hold of those requests and we lift it up. And it's beautiful when we hear answers to prayer because we know as a church that God is moving. He is. And finally, we have the truth. Paul says that the church is a pillar and a foundation of truth. So what does he mean by this? By truth, Paul means divine revelation. The message delivered from God to humankind. He means the truth about who God is, who we are, what is right and what is wrong. And what is the meaning of the universe, when, what this means by which people are made right with God. He, it's all there. He means the gospel that, that and everything else that accompanies it. And so God is known and he's characterized by truth. In contrast, when we look at the scriptures in, in 2 Corinthians 4, the devil is the father of lies and, and the great deceiver, and he despises God and he despises the truth and he despises the church, and Satan's aim is to keep people blinded. That's our fight in our culture. And in the midst of the dark world of sin and deception, there is this entity called the church whose mission is to guard this truth that actually leads to life. And so the church is to be this instrument of God's life-changing, hope-bringing, devil and sin-defeating truth. The truth is a pillar and the found, found, uh, sorry, uh, the church is to be a pillar and a foundation of truth. Now think of the role of a pillar. Whether you, you know, when I say that with buildings with pillars is the banks downtown or the White House, you see those huge pillars out there. The, the purpose is not just to hold up a roof, but the, to thrust the building high enough to make a statement. Think of all the pillars that are featured, like I said, on, in the buildings. We had an opportunity to go to, to Greece, to see, into Turkey, and to see the pillars of the temples. Massive things. A pillar is majestic. It adorns a building to make it seen, to make it noticed. The foundation itself is the structure that provides support and the stability to which it holds. And throughout time and testing, the building will only remain steadfast and whole if the base, if that support, if that foundation is secure and preserved. An entire building can collapse if the foundation is weakened or destroyed. We saw that happen, in, unfortunately, in Florida. And so the church has a dual role. So first, as the foundation, she is to hold the truth firmly so it doesn't collapse under the weight of false teaching, so it doesn't collapse under the weight of societal pressure. And second, the church is the pillar. She is to boldly display the beauty and the majesty of the truth of God. And this is why we have to approach every Sunday as if heaven and hell were on the line, simply because the reality is they are on the line. The church is God's vehicle through which the world comes to understand and know the life-changing message of Jesus. Why he came into this world to save sinners. 
the church is whether as individuals or as a group declares and preserves this life-changing message. It's the message that should be offensive. The message of Jesus, the message of the cross should be offensive, not you and I. Because we have an eternally important news to share. And we ought to protect it, we ought to guard it, we ought to preserve it as if our life is dependent upon it. And we ought to boldly proclaim this truth of the gospel as broadly and as effectively as possible as life depends on it, literally. The eternal life depends on it. So my question to you this morning is, where do you fit in? Where do you fit in? Scripture assures us that we all fit into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is inclusive. Each part is important. As a matter of fact, that the body is actually interdependent upon the other parts, that we're all interconnected. We're all different people, folks. Isn't that wonderful? I'm so glad I'm not like you, and you're so glad you're not like me. Isn't that beautiful? Right? We're all different. We come from many diverse backgrounds, from nationalities, social, socioeconomic circumstances, different races, you know, just like our human bodies has many diverse parts, so does the church. That's the beauty of it. And there are diverse ideas on a variety of issues from politics to the vaccine and mask wearing and so many other things. And the one thing we have in common is that we're part of the body of Christ. If we've been born again, just as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Paul, you know, Paul writes that we all share the same spirit. And if we share the same spirit, we've got to think about this, folks. We share, all share the same goal or life in mission. First and foremost, our goal is the great commission to go and to make disciples of all the nations. So it doesn't matter who we are or where we're from. All that matters is that we're part of the body of Christ just as parts of the human body sustain life. We, are, as the body of Christ, sustain Jesus' body and And the church here on earth is that. Christ sustains Jesus' body. Each part of the body is important. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, but our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And obviously what God has done, he's positioned all these parts in the place and they're needed for the body to function. The body of Christ is designed the same way. You and I are designed the same way as the church. God created us all very unique. And when we're saved, he gifts each of us with a gift that is to be used within the body. We are all special. We're all important to the functionality of the body of Christ. And each of us must perform the function that God has gifted and given us to this body. The body, the church. So that we as a church can function properly and efficiently. Now, not all of us will play the leading roles in the church. Right? We looked at that last week, that there were some were elders, some were deacons, some our apostles, prophets, and goes on. So, some of us have to be supporting actors. But the fact of the matter is that we all have purpose and a place in the church. Each of us is important and essential. And in order for the church to function properly, you must have a variety of parts, again, as I said, that work together as a whole, and remember that each part is important. So let me ask you again, so where do you fit in? So here at Seoul, our vision is, is the why. We desire to be a community of spiritual refuge for all people, a community based on the grace of God to facilitate repair for those who are hurting, and a community that rejuvenates, equips, and empowers people to fulfill their God-given destiny. Our mission is how, <clears throat> how we are loving our world. So at Seoul, we, we break it down this way. We, we want to see people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. That's how we break it down. And so God designed, it's pretty generic when you think of it, so where do I, can I, can I fit in there? Sure you can, because God designed the church so it can also function with precision just like the body does. So this morning, I trust that you received a piece of the puzzle. 
Now, all these pieces make up a complete picture of a historical map that you probably saw when you walked in. Now, if we were to take these pieces and put them all together, which you normally do with a puzzle, we would see a picture of, a, I think it was a 1689 world map. But instead of trying to make your piece fit today, I want you to keep this. Put it in your purse, put it in your wallet. I want you to keep this. And use it to remind you that you are a vital piece of the church here at Soul Sanctuary. And you, when you think about it, have something to contribute. You ever build a puzzle and there's a piece or two missing? Yeah, some of you are going, oh yeah. Right? I did, a, I did, my wife thought we would have a relationship building uh, time this, uh, this summer, so she went out and she bought a 2,000 piece puzzle. It was a one-sided relationship. I just want you to know that because I get fixated on stuff like this. Now, I don't know if it's a male thing because we had people, people come in and help contribute to the design of our Eiffel Tower, but... Uh, it was interesting. Can you imagine not? And I'm, I remember as, a, as the puzzles, as I started filling, I'm almost counting the pieces to make sure that I'm not missing one because I can't find the right piece. And I found that the, the last 20 to 30 pieces for me were the hardest because you're going there with this little angle trying to get it in and it's not working and you step away because your eyes are watering, or at least mine are. We all have something to contribute. Remember, God loves the world, even when there are plenty of reasons not to. And so should we. The famous verse that we see at most major sporting events, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world, and so should we. And I would suggest that this is especially relevant focus this year for us to have. I'm not sure if you know, but tomorrow's election day. Did you pick that up on the news that you watch or listen to? I'm not sure. Or TikTok? Look, if we're not careful, I, I, I said it this way, but I should, say, I should say it this way. Christians have ended up positioning ourselves like an angry, cynical, political action And if we do that, now hear me, let me pastor, let me try to pastor right now. When we do that, we're off our mission. We're off our mission. Conflict in the church, people, goes way back. Remember when we walked through Corinthians and Paul addressed conflict in the first chapter? He writes, it's been reported to me, by the way, that there are quarrels among you. Each of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Paul wasn't the only preacher going around spreading the gospel. There was Apollos, there was Peter, there were others. And the good folks in Corinth decided what? They were going to take sides on an issue. Desperate for belonging and connection, they gravitated to the leaders whom they like. Or they said things that they agreed with or who their neighbors sided with. They started insisting that others fit in as well. And fractions are born within the church. Today, instead of letters, technology has changed, right? We do it through text, social media, TikTok, Reddit. But that desire to belong, really, when you think about it, is still strong. It's so strong, in fact, that we like our, we're, we're almost like our ancestors of the faith and we trample all over each other. And Paul is clearly flabbergasted when he writes this because he responds, he goes, has, has Christ been divided? Is, was Paul crucified for you? You know, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Like, what's going on? And once he moves past this, his response centers on true belonging. And Paul basically says, look, it, God's decided to reach us through something that sounds totally crazy, which was the death and resurrection of Jesus. And for some people, they demanded a sign. Others desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified. That's our message. And that's it. Our belonging to God and to one another is based on this and absolutely nothing else. It's based on our recognition of what God has done for us. Period. Full stop. 
because we find our true identity in Christ. So we're free to grow in a whole ourselves, our true selves, and to bring that whole self into our relationships. But again, it's not as easy as it sounds because the rest of that letter of Paul is trying to help the Corinthians to work out what it really means in their context, which is what I believe that we have to do. You know, and when I'm writing these messages, and part of me is going, well, you're, you're, you're being really hard on people. And, and I'm going, yeah, but you know what? Probably the people who need to hear it aren't here. Or maybe they're online. Or maybe they are here. Or maybe you need to hear it so you can be that agent of love, that agent of restoration the agent who brings people back to the mission in a loving, gentle, and kind way. So, I will say this to those who need to hear it. I hope before that you make your next social media post, oh, that could be just about everybody, but that you think long and hard about how that affects your ability to love your world. Yes, the election is tomorrow. Let me digress just a little bit. Paul writes in Titus, he says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. I think Paul's pretty straightforward. Remind them to be subject to rulers. I can promise you their governmental leaders were far worse than anything that we will ever elect here, especially tomorrow. Remind them to be subject to their rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready for what? People, to be ready for what? Every good deed. To what? To slander nobody. Ladies and gentlemen, do we need to chew on this passage of Scripture? To slander no one, to be peaceable, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all. I want those words to be real in my life and in the life of others. And we're not going to get all wound up about politics because that would just get in the way of us accomplishing our mission. And I think that's the point. If the news or social media is keeping you from unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ, turn it off. Unplug. Prioritize your brothers and sisters in Christ over everything else. We live in such a divided world. We need to be a united church, both locally and universally. Put Jesus and his mission first, and all other issues are tertiary or secondary issues. If there is ever a time that this phrase is most important, it's in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty and all things charity. It couldn't be more real today because we've lost our minds in the Christian culture. And I ask you not to give to the storylines or the blaring voices of the culture or the place where we give in to the outrage of the day. But rather... Let's love one another. Let's serve one another. Let's be patient with one another. Let's mourn with one another. Actually, there are 59 one another's in the New Testament that calls us to be the kind of people that won't give in to the nonsense, but will shine like a light in the darkness. And when we add those 59 one another's as a group, when we come together and non-believers walk in this place, they should sense that. They should feel that. They should be compelled by that. And that's the presence of God working through us. And when you can't do any of that, <laughs> Romans 12, 18, memorize it. It's my favorite verse. It makes it very clear when you can't do any of that. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do your best to live at peace with everyone. And that may mean break your fingers so you can't type. Shut your mouth. Oops, wrap up your mouth. Sometimes 
a very healthy social distancing of a block and a half, if that means living at peace. Boundaries. But it depends on you. And we can also say from John 3.16 that God's love was especially a special demonstrated gift, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. And I think contrary to what, what happens in many in our world seem to believe biblical love, really, when it comes down to it, is all about giving. And what that means is if we're going to love our world the way God loves, there's got to be plenty of evidence that we're giving of our time, people, that we're giving of our talent, that we're giving of our resources to serve. We want soul to be that kind of giving church. We have from the very beginning, we still are to this day. And one of the ways that we give support is to the Great Commission around the world is that we do big missions. This summer we have uh, two of our global workers who are back from the field just for a period of time, and I, I want to introduce to you Bonnie and Evan Falk. <clears throat> so come on up, give them a hand. So uh, these, yeah, I'm going to give you the microphone. I, I trust you. You, can. <laughs> you guys came, I think, in the second year of Seoul. Was that first or second year, I think? Um, very early on, yeah. Yeah? Okay, so you've got to hold the mics really close to, to yourself. So you came very early on, and uh, you didn't know each other. Not no. at the time. No, not at the time. But you got involved in ministry together, and you served um, with our junior high ministry. And you influenced guys like our now youth pastor, right, Andrew. Solitary confinement, if you can't hear Andrew heckling. Like, at, you know, one time you said that you guys were throwing marshmallows at me when I was preaching, or they put kids to uh, dollies and tied them up with duct tape. I do remember that one. And they're no longer working in our youth ministry because they'd be in jail if they were. But, uh, <laughs> but just briefly tell us a little bit of what you're doing. Like, you're here on, on, on a furlough of sorts. And uh, what do you do? Sure. Uh, so Bonnie and I work with uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators, and we've been with them since 2012. And uh, we've lived in the Philippines, in Thailand, and currently we're in Germany. And so in Germany, we... Oh, there's Mennonites here. Germans, do you hear? <laughs> he promised he wasn't going to do the accent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, in Germany, we work with the executive director of our organization. We've got over 4,000 people spread out all over the world. And uh, Bonnie and I work as part of the director's team with communications, just helping keep those 4,000 people connected, communicating, understanding each other, processing things together, and working together as a team. So, so you hear what's going on here. So these people have committed themselves to go and to serve in the field. We as a church, you're, we're part of it, but we're not all of your support. You have to raise support. But they're not these frontline people who are out planting churches and preaching and doing stuff. They are part of the body, a necessary element of the body of organization and giftings that you do from an office perspective and IT that he does. Why? For the advancement of the kingdom. Right? Yep. And I have to say this. You know, as time goes on with COVID and stuff, we're looking for other people who have gifts to contribute. And for some, maybe you can't sing, maybe you can't teach, maybe you can't preach, maybe you can't do anything, but you can give and you can support a missionary, but not only financially, but in prayer. Right? Absolutely. So unabashedly, unashamedly, maybe you're new to our community and you're going, well, how can I can help out? What would I like to do? Well, why don't you consider talking with Evan and Bonnie? They're going to be out on the atrium outside or in the, on the patio outside after the gathering. You can talk to them. You, you can give them a little prayer reminder. Um, maybe God's Spirit is impressing on you to support them financially because you, you need it. You've got about seven, five to $700 that you would like to make up in your budget. Per month. Per month. All right? Can you give 20 Can you give 100 And they'll be able to walk all through you through that. So there's, there's really an urgency in our task because there are issues at stake. Because you are helping people that are right up on the front line. You are organizing and you are making sure that communication goes through. We're part of the body. And as a body, we support you so that you guys don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from. Is that fair to say? Yep. Anything else you want to contribute? Um, well, yeah, if you want to come talk to us either about giving or even just more about our organization or the work that we do, or if 
maybe you feel like you want to get involved in overseas work, we're happy to talk about any of that stuff. Awesome. Thank you for your time. And you guys will be outside, right? Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. You know, Bonnie and Evan have obviously committed their lives, and maybe you could never do what they do, but you can help. You can help contribute. And I'm, yeah, I'm talking about it. I don't have a problem with this. Because we don't benefit, it goes straight to them. And maybe you can help. Help commit in prayer. Help assist in other areas that need to be assisted. Why? Because we are the body. This is what it is all about. And, and again, they've invested in the life of this church. They have given to the life of this church. They are responsible for our youth pastor. <laughs> And uh, maybe you're watching online and, and, and this is, is you know, uh, uh, hitting your heartstrings. Just email us at info at soulsanctuary.ca and we will direct you straight to them and you can communicate directly with Bonnie and Evan. And so I want to encourage you all as individuals. I want to encourage you all as families. And I want to continue to work through this and to ask the Lord to help us see where do we fit in. Again, Jesus' commands to his followers to go and make disciples of all nations and if a church actually did this and somehow we actually went out and taught someone how to live and follow Jesus and what it means to make Jesus Lord of your life and how to live and, and conduct ourselves and your thought life as Jesus teaches us, what would happen? Another church. If we all took this seriously as a team, we would end up with another church. Because this one gathering together wouldn't be enough. It would have to end up reproducing itself. And if we're doing the job that Jesus is calling us to do about being a disciple, about sharing our life with others, and inviting others to come and experience the living God, I can honestly believe that this place would be packed and it's, it's going to get more messy and it's going to get more chaotic. And that's a good feeling. And again, ultimately, the Church of Jesus is a body that is always producing. We don't do the work. God's Holy Spirit does the work. We're just His vessels that He uses to point others to Jesus. So church, pray that in new ways and fresh ways, I pray that you would help us learn what it means to love our world and in doing so to become more like you. Help us to get rid of the old and to allow you to grow new in our lives. So that God, we would face our sin, our pride, our arrogance, our deception, our racism, our abuse, our bigotry, and throw it off that we would experience new life and new growth. So Father, help us see people becoming disciples of Jesus. And finally, we pray for our country and its next leader. Help us, I ask God. Bless us, Father. And may we leave in awe of you this morning, and may we be in awe of you all week. Amen. Right after this gathering, right upstairs, track. If you haven't signed up and you still want to join, you want to find out more, it's about an hour long, is that fair to say? If you have an hour before lunch, you can actually just walk in. Uh, a number of people have already pre-registered, but you can just walk in and say, hey, 
I want to find out more. If you have the time and you're that flexible, then please join us. Um, the band's going to sing us out, but in that process, uh, if you are able-bodied, we just need to stack these chairs eight high because things are starting to slowly get back to normal. And uh, we have Elections Canada here tomorrow. So if you can do us a favor and you can stack your chair eight high or one high is fine. And if you can't stack, that's okay because you're not that part of the body. <laughs> In ancient times, one who blessed extended his hands for a blessing. Those receiving blessing did likewise. So as you go, soul sanctuary, may you go filled with the love and the mercy of Jesus. May the Holy Spirit enable you to live and speak words filled filled, hear me, filled with love and joy. Be happy. And may you go in his name, may you go in his love, may you go with his blessing, and may we see you next week. Church, now go, live the church.